All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Z, and thank you to ATI and South by Southwest for hosting us this morning. We are just delighted to be here having this conversation with you all about building for growth and what it takes for a startup in its earliest days to be thinking about the long term. And by thinking about how at this very early, very pivotal point in its lifetime, it can be making decisions that set it up for success in a range of different areas uh, later in its lifetime. So we'll dig into the content in a minute. First, let's introduce our esteemed group of panelists, starting with myself. I'm Allison Rines. I am the site head for J-Labs at Texas Medical Center. We are J&J's strategic incubator. Let me introduce uh, the rest of the panelists, starting with Beth uh, to my right. Uh, please introduce yourselves uh, with your name, title, and the scope of your role and what you're currently doing. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Beth McKeon. I'm based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I'm here kind of wearing two hats, uh, both representing my company, Fluent, where we have a data technology that measures uh, early stage product market fit and uh, business model risk for investors, accelerators, economic development organizations uh, across the country, and also uh, just recently joined uh, an organization, a nonprofit in Cambridge called Ignite VC to lead and build up uh, infrastructure to help increase diversity in the funding pathways for uh, biotech companies. Hi, I'm Nick Payne. I am the CTO and co-founder of a local Austin company here called Aptronic. Uh, we are building general purpose humanoid robots to help address the uh, prevalent labor shortage issues that we're facing as a, as a world. And good morning. I'm Julia Martin. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for ATI, or your sponsor for today. Um, and who are we? We are a nonprofit, large nonprofit corporation, uh, and a consortium manager. And what do those words mean? Um, we are about facilitating. Uh, solutions among government and industry. So we try to provide value in the acquisition support for the government, uh, help them to reach technology providers like many of you, uh, and to really solve their problems. How, how, how can they reach out and find people that are not the Boeings, the Lockheeds of the world, but that have relevant technologies that are going to solve their, their requirements and meet their requirements? So uh, we're in the middle of that. We're uh, trying to help the, the non-traditional companies meet with the government, understand the requirements, and figure out is there a, a way that, that they can work together. It gives government access to those non-traditionals as well. So that's what we do. Terrific. Um, well, as y'all can see, we have a diverse set of perspectives today. Some investors, some operators, and some folks who have a mix of experience on both sides. Um, so to start off this debate, um, or this, this uh, discussion, maybe it may become a debate, we'll see. Um, we, we typically use the word incubator to describe a venue where startups can go in their earliest stages uh, to be sort of protected from the broader environment and get the nurturing and support that they need. Um, so this uh, metaphor of, if you think of like a true sapling, this, the term incubator has become so commonly used that sometimes we don't actually think about it's, uh, what, what it really actually means literally. Um, and so if you think about a small plant that needs to be protected from the broader environment, but at the same time as building itself to grow into a strong tree, but the decisions that are being made at this time where it's fighting for its survival and it's thinking day to day, how do I survive? These are, this is the same time where there is an opportunity for pivots that down the line can have a huge impact on its success or not. Uh, and as a startup founder, uh, in my role, I talk with um, so startup founders all the time who are dealing with this question of how do I survive day to day, but at the same time, they are dealing with this incredible opportunity rather than a challenge to be able to make decisions with a huge impact down the line. Uh, so we're going to talk about this question from the perspective of both a startup operator and an investor um, as to how startups can be thinking about making these kinds of pivotal decisions across a range of different aspects of their business. Um, so Beth, let me start with you. Uh, speaking about Fluent, uh, can you talk to us about best practices from an operator's perspective? Yeah, I think uh, it's a tricky thing to be a founder that has a, a giant vision and is motivated to build something that's really impactful, that's gonna change the world, a billion dollar opportunity. And we have to, we have to operate from that place because the work is so hard. Like, like the thing that's exciting is that opportunity. Uh, but at the same time, we have to hold 
like with a lot of discipline, the reality that today there are a series of things that have to be focused on that are so risky, the unknowns are so risky that not solving for those right now will potentially like like kill the business completely. And so it's about being able to hold the big vision, but also be laser, laser focused on the right thing. And I think it's, um, it's often the case that as founders, we can get so drawn into the pitch or the narrative or the future state that we like kind of either allow the hard risky things to go unaddressed in the, at the stage that they need to be, or uh, we just don't even notice what those are. And so I think uh, being able to hold these two competing pieces of the business, the macro and the micro at the same time, are incredibly important. Very interesting. Um, let's hear, Nick, uh, from your perspective, um, your career trajectory has been interwoven with the history of Aptronic. Can you tell us both about how your career has progressed uh, and in parallel, how the business has thought about some of these types of decisions? Sure, so um, my name is, is Nick and I've uh, really kind of taken on the technical side of our, our founding story. My co-founder was uh, Jeff Cardenas, he's our, our CEO. And you know, I, I was graduating from UT Austin with a PhD and I was really not focused on becoming an entrepreneur. I kind of stumbled into it. Uh, whereas my counterpart, Jeff, uh, he always talks about how he grew up dreaming about being an entrepreneur. He really was inspired by people like Steve Jobs and others. And um, you know, it was a fortuitous meeting between the two of us, but uh, for me it was really about uh, focusing on the difficult problems of today and thinking about how they'll be solved tomorrow. So uh, for me I was focused on you know, how do I want to spend my, uh, my next few years choosing you know, what grad school degree I would go into and, and if I would pursue a PhD. And I really just looked at things that I was excited about, things that I was passionate about. And at the time, this was you know, 10 or 15 years ago, um, there were some exciting things happening in robotics, but uh, it was not nearly uh, a widespread foregone conclusion that this would be a widespread, you know, useful thing uh, in the world. Um, and so for me, I just, again, followed sort of my, my intuition and curiosity and passions uh, down this field. Um, but for us, it was, um, you know, I had the opportunity to work with NASA early on in my, my career. Uh, that was part of my PhD. Um, and I also had the opportunity to work with several other organizations. And um, that was really exciting work that um, we wanted to, to, to take it from the lab and have it make an impact in the real world. So that was really sort of when I started thinking about crossing that uh, chasm from academic research into a uh, commercial endeavor. Um, and for us, um, the idea of building robots that could go out and, and make a, a real impact in the world was a, a massive uh, problem and a challenge. For us, we, we took on a lot of uh, non-dilutive capital to, to make that a reality, um, not be pressured too quickly into market, but really kind of testing uh, our ability to go and create the technology, the technology and underlying foundations of that. Um, more recently, we've, we've expanded our, um, our uh, VC uh, funding and we've really become focused on uh, the product that we're de delivering uh, but that transition from non-dilutive capital into uh, dilutive capital is kind of the, the key thing for us. Terrific. Well, let's bookmark that because we're going to talk about different types of capital uh, later in the discussion. Um, Julia, let's hear from you. Um, you have a broad view into many different types of companies uh, in your role, sort of a macro perspective. Uh, can you talk to us about best practices that you've seen from interacting with different companies? Yeah, you know, we were um, obviously talked beforehand, and I've given this some thought because we, uh, when you think about successful startups and what makes them successful, what differentiates them from others that sort of, you know, turn into the zombies that you hear about, and I, it is, uh, as an, you meet entrepreneurs, and what do, what do they want to talk about? They want to talk about their technology, right? What's exciting, the problem that they're trying to solve, the good that they're trying to do in the world, how they're going to improve and disrupt, you know, current practices. And I would just encourage uh, folks to also, while you're uh, resolving your technical risk, also be thinking about the business side, right? Obviously, that's my background, but um, how are you, think about market entry strategy. Like, how, who's going to buy it, right? And, and realize that there is a, a market economy that already exists. There are processes that already exist. Do you know where you're going to go? We, the, the earlier panel was talking about the complexities of supply chain. Where are you in, in that pathway? Um, who are you selling to? How are they going to pay for what you want? Is there going to be a cost 
to that company to adopt your disruptive technology over what they've currently got? Are you going to be able to overcome their inertia with your value proposition? Those who really be thinking about your business strategy and the risks around the business as well as the technology risk. Um, it, we uh, work with folks in the medical device space, right, and, and they're focused on how to how to get their right coding and approvals for the CMS and CPT codes and those kinds of things. But if you have a device, yes, you, it's got to get implanted or used by a patient, but is that really the regulatory pathway? You need other uh, codes and um, approvals and other things to get a device because the hospital's got to buy the device as well as put it in, right? So the doctor can get reimbursed, but is somebody actually going to get paid for buying your device in, in that kind of space? And there's all kinds of regulatory pathways. So be thinking about that and surrounding yourself with folks that can help you with these business risks, right? Um, because the technology is fun and it's cool and it is disruptive. And I was thinking about the gentleman on the panel yesterday from Smart Cups who had a lot of opinions about, um, you know, and his, his quotable quote was, uh, you know, we have this awesome thing that's going to solve a lot of problems in the world, but who gives this shit? So, um, and it, unless you understand how to enter the market, right, and, and uh, what you have to overcome when you come into the market. So I'll stop there. But there's a lot around the business side, and I just encourage you to surround yourself with folks who can advise you as you're developing your technology solution to also be thinking about what does that mean and how do I turn that into a commercializable business. Interesting. Um, I think your comments on the business side are, are super interesting because um, often uh, we find startup founders uh, thinking about long-term business strategy um, in not necessarily a truly interleaved way with funding strategy. Um, so I want to pick up on your point, and we'll come back to funding strategy in a bit, um, but to thinking about uh, the future of the business. So one area where I have seen startups get into trouble uh, is in thinking about whether they're going to become a product business or a service business, uh, going down business rat holes with different archetypes of what type of business they want to be. Um, and the world, of course, has space for many different kinds of businesses. We all interact with many different kinds of businesses all the time. Uh, but one uh, key factor that I've found in dealing with a broad range of startups uh, is the need for a level of intentionality in deciding which ones of those things you want to be and really being purpose-driven about that. Uh, so we've talked a bit just now about uh, the business and planning for long-term business success. Uh, let me turn it over to Nick to speak about planning for long-term technical success. Um, so what is the corollary of that when it comes to thinking about R&D strategy? And so imagine you have uh, your product strategy in place um, and you're thinking about building for long-term technical success. What does that look like from the outset? Yeah, that's been a fascinating journey uh, from, from our perspective. Um, so we, we set out to solve very ambitious problems that were, you know, these are 10, 20 year types of, of problems, but you can't go to an investor or find a grant that funds you for that long. So you need to think about, you know, how do I build towards that? Um, and for us, you know, we, we've, we have been intentional, but we've also learned throughout the process and we've tried something and when we see it doesn't work, we try something else and we, we change and we, uh, react to the data that we're, we're being presented with. Um, and so for us, um, early on, we, we were primarily focused on building the foundational elements of our technology. Um, we were less concerned about focus at that point in time, and we were really just looking for how do we fund the company, how do we build the kind of key foundational elements that we need, that we'll need, you know, eight to ten years from now. Um, and so in that sense, we very much were more of a service a services company, uh, the key thing being due to our funding strategy, <clears throat> we really were focused on retaining our core IP. So that I think is a, <clears throat> at least as a te technology company, a very important element of your strategy is thinking about your IP for the long, the long term. Um, but that was probably about five years of, of living off you know, non-elutive funding, SBIRs, commercial contracts, but being very intentional about retaining our intellectual property. Um, and maybe, you know, uh, having an, a sense of our North Star and trying to move in that direction, but, you know, if we had to pit, uh, veer off from there a little bit, that was okay because we were still, you know, primarily moving in the right direction. Um, as we got further down, though, probably about five years into the company, we, we felt like our technology was mature enough that we were within the time window that a venture capitalist would need to have, you know, ROI. So typically if you raise 
you know, a series C or A or B, you, you try to scope that so you have you know, 18, 24 months to you know, have a meaningful milestone. Um, and at that point, we really kind of transitioned the company to be very product focused. We did not take on you know, extraneous efforts that were deviating from that core uh, thesis. And um, that's when we really thought about scaling. We really thought about um, very heavy uh, understanding of the market, understanding of our customers, how we would enter that market. Uh, and that really kind of ramped up that product focused activity. Very interesting. So we've heard about building from a business perspective. We've heard about it from a technical and product perspective. Let's talk about it from a financing perspective. Um, Beth, over to you. Let's talk about best practices for raising venture capital. When is venture capital appropriate? Do you have thoughts on other types of, uh, let's say venture capital for a moment because we're gonna um, come back to non-dilutive capital later. Um, what are your advice to companies about uh, when it makes sense to start thinking about raising, how much, um, what are the right uh, different types of, uh, should we be thinking about equity, should we be thinking about debt, uh, convertible notes, and so on? Sure. Uh, I first just want to reflect that, my goodness, if everyone can just sort of follow the model that Nick just <laughs> described, that's a pretty good, like, like, I think that there's like a lot of sophisticated thinking there. Um, around like kind of recognizing when it's the right time and then being really strategic in the time before that. Uh, it's, it's not uncommon for startups to be like, well, I know my big dream is gonna need VC, so I'm gonna start working on it now way before, you know, before the company is gonna actually be accepted by that, that market. So, you know, <laughs> do that. Uh, but I, I also think um, that it, it is like, Raising capital from from prof professional investors is such a relationship exercise um, that I think we often, uh, you know, we'll talk about like, well, you have to be a scalable business and you have to eventually be able to do a hundred million dollars in annual AR or whatever, right? Like there's like sort of these like benchmarks that we talk about. And I think like at the end of the day, way before you're ready to even like build the pitch deck and start talking to investors, like figuring out who those people are going to be and building relationships with them, not because you're gonna actually raise money from them in the future, but because like talking to them two years or three years maybe before you're even ready to raise money means that you'll actually know like, oh, this fund is actively writing checks and they're looking for deals in this space. And like when they talk to a company, they're looking for these factors. You already have sort of the, the framework in mind so that when you talk to investors, you're actually showing up and talking to the right people at the right time. Um, the, it, it is about relationships. Terrific. Um, now let's talk about non-dilutive capital. Um, Julia, uh, let's hear from you. What is your advice to founders in thinking about different types of non-dilutive capital that might be options to them? Yeah, so I, I would say, so this is sort of what we facilitate, right? How do we batch technology solutions with opportunities for government funding? Um, and uh, if you think about, as a company saying, I wanna pitch my solution to the, or I see this funding opportunity, um, I would say think about the government funder as a type of investor. Like what would you do to prepare to pitch in front of an investor, right? That's the same kind of mentality that you need to have when you're evaluating government funding opportunities because the people behind those decisions are also, they have expectations, right? They have requirements that they're trying to meet. They have timelines that they're trying to meet just like an, R, an investor might have an ROI timeline, right? Um, there's not gonna be a financial necessarily, but maybe some technical outcomes. So think about really evaluating those opportunities to determine do they align with your strategy. Um, I'd, I'd like, you know, I'm, I'm also with Beth on follow what Nick does, right? So we <laughs> think about how in your development cycle those non-dilutive funding opportunities can move what you're already trying to do forward and at the same time align with government requirement so uh, so that those two things are in alignment, right? You, I've seen, I've 
I have seen a startup company who had a good technology get very derailed because they had a technology and a market plan for a complete for one industry, and they thought this technology can get applied to this government opportunity that I see in a completely different application, and they're spending resources and a lot of things. Now, it was a great outcome for the, the military health at the, at the time, but it's, the military is not going to be able to support that business and be a large client because they didn't have the demand signal, right? So that goes back to sort of understanding your market. Um, so I would just say when you are looking at funding opportunities, because of funding, I think this uh, two or three people yesterday said the government can be an amazing partner, right, in what you're trying to accomplish. Why? Because they're rooting for you. We're all rooting for you, right, to be successful when you have technologies that are going to change the world. And But how do you get all those right circumstances in line so that you can achieve your objectives and then also contribute to sort of these national priorities and what the government is trying to accomplish for all of us, right? So I'll stop there, but I mean, no, there's a lot that, that's to unpack, yeah. Yeah, and Julia, I think you've said something really important, which is the minute you take funding, whether it's venture funding, non-dilutive funding, you're basically bringing in a partner to your business. So thinking about the right smart money, the right partner whose objectives are aligned to your objectives as founders, uh, it's something that's critical, regardless of the type of funding that you're bringing in. Um, Let's continue in the thread with non-dilutive capital and maybe come back to Nick on other types of non-dilutive capital uh, besides government funding specifically. Uh, can you talk about best practices that you've seen when companies have done this well or maybe not done it as well? Yeah, so I think, first of all, it's good to understand the options that you have. Um, and for us, you know, like I said before, understanding you know, our risk profile and the people that were interested in the types of things that we were doing, it, it kind of limited what we were able to do. Um, but I think the other thing, too, to consider is um, there's benefits of having a bit of a mixture of, of non-dilutive or maybe government and uh, commercial funding. Um, one of the things I was just thinking about is that um, oftentimes, you know, if you're in uh, an economic recession, then oftentimes that's when government ramp, you know, funding is starting to ramp up. So there's some counter cyclicality, uh, I guess, of uh, the, the types of funding. And so it can be helpful in, if you're in a, you know, bad economic times, you can have other sources of capital that can help uh, support your company. Um, I think aside from that, you know, we, we have had uh, non-government, non-dilutive funding, which are, you know, typically more, they feel a bit more like services contracts, but again, if you can be careful about your IP, those can also be, uh, you know, sources of revenue or other ways to, to fuel the company. Um, but like you, I think, like you were saying, it, it is all about really understanding the the customer, the investor, understanding what their pain points are, and um, seeing if there's a good fit there with um, your long-term ambitions and uh, what that, that effort is being funded. Terrific. Beth, anything to add from that based on your experience as an investor? Uh, well, actually, I would say um, maybe more from having run accelerator programs and built a company. I, I, yeah, I have yeah. more of a, an opinion on this. Um, I think that there are ways to make money from your customers way earlier than you think. And it is easy to, to, to kind of be held back and say, but the technology isn't ready and it's, it's, not, it's not perfect yet. And um, the, the customers that need your solution the most, the early adopters, uh, they will chase you down the street with cash for a thing that is half built and mostly broken because their problem is so acute. And, like get like get that revenue because it's going to help the company like continue to fuel that R and D, um, but you're also learning such critically important things from those customers because they one believe in it, they want it to succeed. You're hearing it from the exact right people, not just some advisor that like maybe built something ten years ago, but like literally the person is like, no, but I need the button to be here. Can you please put the button here? Uh, and they're giving you money to do that. So there's a really collaborative like feedback loop with those early customers. You can make it perfect later. That's terrific. Um, so we've talked a lot about non-dilutive funding in the form of grants. Now let's talk about non-dilutive funding in the form of partnering. Um, this fits nicely with a point that Nick made earlier about IP strategy um, and the right way to manage your IP. Um, so to any of the three of you, what's the best way for companies to think about partnering? I mean, I think, like, like you were saying, um, depending on, you know, if you're a technology company, then IP is your, you know, your moat, it's your lifeblood. Um, and so I think it's, 
these types of decisions were when I, as an engineer, found the value of, of having a, a business person that I was working with. You know, I, I thought early on as an engineer, you know, my perfect company would be just you know, all engineering, but um, there are really important business decisions, and uh, I think I've also heard the, the advice that if you can't afford a good lawyer, you can't afford to be in business. Like, there's decisions that you make very early on that can have profound impacts and uh, really affect the overall value of your, your company. And um, I think it depends also on your, your preference, too. Um, for us, for me, th my company and this company was an extension of the five years that I put into grad school. And so, you know, I, I really wanted to, you know, swing for the fences and have this be a, you know, a home run or nothing. I, I didn't want to have a base hit. Um, but that's not everyone's strategy. You know, sometimes uh, you, you intentionally want to have a base hit, and um, uh, it's okay to, you know, to try to think about your exit strategy earlier on. Um, but for us, yeah, IP was, was key to our strategy, and I think every single um, opportunity that we evaluated had to be looked at and scrutinized from that perspective because it was so crucial to our overall long-term strategy. What about from either of the other two of you? How have you seen this play out in different types of businesses? So I will say, you know, when it comes to your resources are always limited, right? And so to look around, uh, there are local, state, federal economic development resources that are available to you to leverage to get some of this advice, maybe seed capital type stuff that won't set valuation too early, all of those kinds of things. So. Um, don't be shy about trying to connect with whatever resources are in your area or outside of your area or from your connections here um, at South by Southwest. Um, this is what we do as ATI, so I'm going to do a shameless plug about that. Um, it's all about collaboration for us, right? Networking, connecting people, not just connecting government to businesses, but businesses to businesses. Um, so that outcomes can happen, right? Yes, we have a lot of non-dilutive non non funding opportunities for our members, but there's also tremendous value in the resources and coaching and education that you can get about how to play in different markets and how to you know, so find entry points for funding sources. So I would just, I, I, I mean, I know Nick sort of said that too, look at your individual circumstances, but also try to really look at exhausting your, um, understanding of what resources are available to you because you can't have too many, right? You can use, uh, most of the help that you, uh, I'm not gonna say all help is helpful, but uh, everyone can use all the help they can get. And I know that early in my career I'd worked with some economic development, state economic development efforts, and you know, the, there are a lot of resources out there, and if you're willing to partner uh, and talk about how that can help work for you, I think there, uh, that's one one thing to do. And, you know, um, one of our consortia, the, Med Tech, uh, the Medical Technology Enterprise Consortia, they, they offer commercialization services, you know, to their, to their members so that uh, if you need help with your regulatory path, so there's, there's just, you don't know where those resources are until you start looking for them. I love that perspective on intangibles and this idea that there's so much to be gained for early stage companies that is non-financial, whether it's advice, whether it's in the form of a mentorship and connections and so on. Um, and that's actually a huge part of what we do um, at J-Labs, where we work with companies from their earliest stages to supply them with the right connectivity, the right mentorship from a pharma perspective in a non-confidential way, um, and other sort of non-quantifiable aspects mm -hmm. that can affect the business down the line. Um, Beth, let's hear from you from an uh, incubator perspective. How have you seen those types of resources support companies? Uh, so the, the organization that, um, that launched Ignite VC, which I'm now running, uh, is called Lab Central, and it's a nonprofit incubator in Cambridge. And I, I just recently heard someone describe what their, their kind of secret sauce is, uh, and it's, it's sort of the AWS for for you know, drug discovery, because you can like just like walk in the door and start doing the science, and it doesn't require sort of like the build out and the the hundred million dollar like you know investment to get started and everything. And I mean, just the ability to move faster at, at the earliest stages um, for for anyone, whether it's you know whether it's uh, in the medical biotech side or it's a physical product or even just software, like finding the places where you can like tap into resources and just go and, and not have like the spin up time is really valuable. 
Interesting. Um, so now we've talked about companies across a range of industries. Um, some of these industries um, have different types of operating models where on the one hand, let's say biotech or tech, uh, as Nick mentioned earlier, um, IP is absolutely critical. Other types of businesses, um, other aspects are more important to think about early on. Um, let's hear from each of the panelists about the different industries they've interacted with. How are they similar or different? And is there a unified set of best practices for companies across all industries, or is it really industry dependent? Um, Beth, let's start again with you. Sure. Uh, I've been really surprised by this, actually, uh, with the Fluency Square, which is my data technology company, uh, in the early days, I, 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 we actually wouldn't sell into life science organizations. Um, we, could, we could measure companies doing B2B, B2C, kind of direct to consumer, uh, like a wide, wide, wide range of, of companies, hardware, software, all, really all over. And I was very, very confident in that. Uh, and I was like, if you have a, if you have a cure for cancer, you don't have a business model problem. There is no product market fit risk if you have a cure for cancer. Don't need don't need to be measuring that component. Uh, and in fact, I had uh, I had those those organizations serving those early you know incubators across the country saying no no actually like even within this category we need to be making sure that we're solving the right people the right problem for the right people in the earliest phases. And so. Um, I, I think that there's more similarity than not at the end of the day to build a business. You have to solve a problem for a very specific group of people that are willing to pay you money. And that is the challenge in the earliest days. Uh, and so getting really, really laser focused on where you're at in like recognizing which of those challenges needs to be addressed is, is kind of universal. Interesting, all right, Nick, what about you? Um, <clears throat> I guess the way that I've, looked at different industri industries is, um, I mean, ultimately it's, it's not, maybe not, it may not seem that profound, but as a entrepreneur, when you're evaluating maybe strategic decisions or you know, different options that you have, everything boils down to risk. And so you're really just assessing, uh, you know, what is the level of risk involved in this decision? Um, and so I think when we look at different verticals, we kind of look at it from that perspective. Um, for us, typically there's two main uh, categories that you could maybe think about the Venn diagram between those two categories. Um, one of them is, is market risk, uh, and the other one is technical risk. So can we solve this problem, and is there you know, demand out there for it? Um, when we look at different markets, and I would presume this is how maybe non-technical companies think about this too, um, we, we think about you know, where is there demand? How can we de-risk the business uh, and market aspects of this? And so I would maybe a piece of advice I would suggest for, for folks out there is go in and you know, do your homework, assess the different uh, markets that you have, uh, and, and really kind of understand those, the, the pain points, and listen to it and see you know, where are these people you know, uh, knocking down my door and chasing after me, even if I don't have a complete product. Um, that can be a really helpful, um, I guess, piece of uh, advice to, to think about. But then you, know, you also need to assess um, the risk from other perspectives. For instance, um, for us, we build robots, and so we need to think about are there you know, safety certifications that we need to, to get for this. Uh, operating in the medical field you know, has significantly uh, higher consequences for uh, a fault or a failure than maybe in a, uh, you know, carrying a box in a warehouse or something like that. If you drop a box, you know, a life is not at risk. Um, and so I think that's a major area for us is um, those uh, market factors like safety, certifications, uh, and other regulations uh, are key factors as well. Um, I think there's, there's maybe the last piece of this was uh, the, you know, working maybe with government versus non-government. Um, there's different uh, factors at hand, and, um, you know, the, the stakeholders, the, the key decision makers are, are different in those different scenarios, and so understanding you know, who really can make the funding decision for um, this, this agreement um, can be a little bit different in the different verticals too. 
Interesting. And Julia, from your perspective. Yeah, so uh, good, good comments, I think, from the panel, because um, I do agree with Beth. I think there's more, of course, I'm a, again, I'm a business person. I'm not a, a technology uh, person, scientist. And so I do think from a business perspective, there are a lot of similarities. Um, but when you, it, it, so I agree with that. I also think that depending on the business, to Nick's point, you know, are you, going to have to be operating in a highly regulated environment. Do you need manufacturing capability? That's very different than someone who is running an IT company, right? So, um, or with a software solution that's not going to need um, <laughs> safety certifications and other things. We do a lot of work with the DOD. Well, guess what? In order for you to do work with the DOD, there are things that you need to be able to say that you're able to do too, and maybe those are things that are important to you or not important to you. So there are, there are a lot of things about core business. Who is your customer? How are they going to pay? Are they interested? Can you, can you get in that, that chain somewhere? Um, but that's true for every business out there, right? But then when you're each individual company is going to have their own set of circumstances that they're going to have to navigate um, that, to some of the comments that have already been made. So I, I think there's a, there's a combination. And what works for one, you, you know, you may have said, hey, I mean, you may, there's serial entrepreneurs and I did this and this worked for me one time. That doesn't mean that in a completely different industry, that's gonna, that same formula is going to work again. And so just to be aware of those similarities and differences, I think is important. Interesting. Um, so we've talked about funding, we've talked about planning for the business and product, uh, we've talked about technical planning, we've talked about IP planning. Uh, one thing that we haven't talked about yet when it comes to building for success for the long term uh, is team building. Um, what are the aspects of building a great team from the beginning? Um, Nick, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think this is probably the most important decision that you make as a, a founder. Uh, if you look at I think it's, it's true for us, I think it's probably true for most companies. The most, uh, I mean, from a cost standpoint, the most expensive resource you're paying for is people. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you don't have a good team, uh, you're not really setting yourself up for success. Um, I guess a quick anecdote, in grad school, you know, I, I, again, I, I never planned to be an entrepreneur. I kind of stumbled into it through, you know, applying for SBARs and, and kind of you know, getting more and more into uh, commercialization. But um, I didn't have, you know, I went to school at, uh, here at, in Austin at uh, University of Texas, and we were not known as a big robotics school when I was there. Um, you know, I, I could have gone to East Coast or West Coast, but um, I, I found myself here, and um, I, I was not armed with <clears throat> this, you know, superstar set of, of peers that I was just going to go and, and like, Cajole into joining my company. Uh, so back then, you know, 10 years ago, I, I had no you know, even idea that uh, building a company like what we have would even be possible. Um, but there was one or two people that we started off with that have been through us, you know, the, through, been with us throughout the entire journey. And those you know, kind of key individuals were crucial to our, our success. Um, that kind of is in the category of founders or people who are so committed to the company, maybe they have a lot of equity in the company, maybe not, maybe they just believe in the, the vision. Um, but those people are, are the most valuable resources I think you can have. Um, th those people are also the, the few people that can share the uh, stress and burden that is inevitable with most companies. And most startups die, and the ones that survive probably come very close to, to death at some point. Um, so even just the uh, emotional support, uh, you know, my wife is, is very supportive, but she's not, you know, uh, exposed maybe to all the, the challenging decisions that, and, and risks that we see. Um, so I think those core founding members are, are really, have been very critical for us. Um, beyond that, you know, you, you get to a point where um, you start, at least for us, you know, we didn't have, we weren't serial entrepreneurs. Uh, we, we did this kind of for the first time sort of out of our garage in a sense. And at some point we thought, you know, we need to probably hire some people that have done this before and, you know, that have, uh, you know, as one of our advisors says, who's been in this movie before, they kind of, you know, can uh, re you know, uh, react to, to patterns um, that, that they've experienced before. And we looked for people that uh, had a lot of, um, you know, proven track records, like I need to go build a manufacturing line. Can I go find someone that has done that? Um, 
And with those people, sort of the, maybe at the C-suite level or the leaders of the company, um, in my mind, it's like it's a binary thing. I, I would not skimp on you know, those people. Um, you do not want to go and try to like go in the bargain bin to find you know those <laughs> those leaders. Um, this, this, regardless of how much you know equity or or salary that that they cost, uh, they will be the differentiators between success and failure. So, you know, you can claim you know however much equity you want of a failing company, but if it's not successful, it will you know be a big slice of a zero uh, sum uh, pie. Very well said. Beth, what about from your perspective? Yeah, uh, the first thing that came to mind when you said team was trust. It's, it's like, especially in the, the like that core early team, like the, the, the ability to build a high trust, high tr highly transparent, high velocity team is how you can kind of overcome a lot of the, just like the initial kind of iteration and, and uh, building a startup isn't a straight line. There's no straight line in innovation. Like it's it's this winding circle, and so there's got to be a way for the the team to be able to communicate really really well with a high degree of trust to get through kind of all those like dead ends and and, and pivots. Terrific. And uh, Julia, what about from your perspective? So uh, can I just say, Amen. Um, I think you know after you're you're through through some of the initial risk mitigation. Um, if you're wanting your business to scale, it comes down to management experience, right? It really, really does come to leadership. To come down to leadership, and I'm I'm with Nick. Don't skimp on that um, because those folks are the ones that are going to take you through it, um, and that's what investors are looking at too, right? Um, what what is what are the qualifications of the team that's going to bring the solution to market, and and do they have the wherewithal to to, to lead and to take us to the next level. So I, I do think um, I'm with you on the, the management experience and the qualifications of that management team is gonna be critical long term. So from a team perspective, we've heard about hiring high quality people, the right people with the right skill set. Uh, we've heard about building culture and building trust. Um, I would add a couple of uh, points to this discussion. Uh, one around thinking about the timing of the people you hire. Uh, so I talk with a lot of startups about when is the right time, especially for technical founders, to bring in a CEO. When is the right time to bring in a chief business officer who has experience with fundraising? Um, and there's not one right way to do this. This is going to be different for every company. Uh, but I would say a level of intentionality and honesty with yourselves as founders about your skill set and the skill sets that you need at a given point in your development uh, is critical. Uh, another area where I've seen companies make decisions in their early days that have led to, let's say, headaches down the line uh, is in thinking about their leveling as they're bringing in new members of their team. They're doing that first, second, third wave of hiring. Hopefully, these are folks gonna, that are going to be with you for the long haul and thinking about what your company is going to look like from an org structure down the line. Um, so in a couple of minutes, we're going to shift to questions from the audience. Uh, so I'm going to ask folks who have questions to begin queuing at the mics, uh, and we'll open it up to the group. Uh, but one final question before we do that. Um, so taking a step back, this is my first year at South by Southwest. Do we have any other first timers in the audience? Awesome. That's terrific. Um, one of the things that has struck me in the last couple of days about South by Southwest has been the interdisciplinary aspect this idea that not only can good ideas come from anywhere, but good ideas come from the boundaries between disciplines and the intersections between disciplines. Uh, so I'm going to take a step back to my background, uh, which is my academic training as a mathematical and computational biologist. Uh, and mathematical and computational biologists love nothing more than to put letters and numbers to a phenomenon and then give it a <laughs> catchy, quippy name, usually derived from a great work of literature. <laughs> Um, so is anybody in the audience familiar with the Anna Karenina principle? Any statisticians or Russian literature uh, <laughs> experts in the audience? No. All right. The beginning of Anna Karenina goes something like this. All happy families are alike in their happiness, and all unhappy families are unhappy in their own unique way. And so if you sit on that for a moment, what that basically means is there are a set of necessary conditions that all have to be met to get to success. So a failure of any one of these conditions leads to unhappiness or failure. But conversely, there are as many ways to fail as there are conditions. So an almost infinite combination of ways to fail. So, so far, if we think about for building for success, up to now, we've made an Anna Karenina list 
of things that companies need to do in order to be successful. They need to get their funding strategy right, they need to get their business and product strategy right, they need to get their IP strategy right, they need to get their team right. What else should we add to the Anna Karenina list for early stage companies? Beth, let's start with you. Oh man, that was, <laughs> what, that was quite a lead up, I don't know. <laughs> you said you were gonna throw a curveball, well done. <laughs> I did, I did, all right. Um, yeah, um, I, Man, I think that um, there, the answer to this is really depressing, unfortunately. Uh, it's the one I hate the most, and, and I think about it a lot. So I, I live in the world of wanting to like, figure out like, how can we rationalize this work? How can we de-risk this work? How can we like, work on the right things at the right time, like, be focused, be disciplined, all those things, right? And I think that we have a lot of areas of control in this. And at the end of the day, so much of success has to do with timing. And there is an element of luck in this kind of space that we're in. And, and so, I mean, there, there might be right answers. I, some of the, the sessions at this conference that I'm the most excited about are the ones where uh, it's people talking about like how to think like a futurist and how to like, like start to envision like future outcomes and things like that. Because I think there's a lot we can do to imagine how we can build for the future we want to see. Uh, but man. Timing. timing. Timing is one of those components in, in the Anna Karenina model that we have to really keep an eye out for. I completely agree with you. <laughs> Nick, is there anything else you'd put on the Anna Karenina list? Um, I don't know. I was thinking back to uh, the comments about incubation and advisors, and I guess maybe the thought I would leave this uh, group with is um, no one can look into a crystal ball and tell you the decisions that you need to make today to be successful tomorrow. Um, I think there are you know, people that have, have been in similar situations before and they can give you maybe some sage advice. There might be you know, less critical decisions that uh, are obvious um, decisions to make, but um, it's, I agree, timing is really important and you can't anticipate when that's gonna happen. So I would say, you know, listen to advice you get from others, surround yourself with, with people that, that have, um, you know, experience, but then, you know, be passionate about what you're doing. And uh, if, if you think you'll be successful, that's probably the most important factor to, to, to success. Passion, I love it. Essential ingredient for success. <laughs> All right, Julia, final comments before we So, yeah, I w I'm thinking about what can I add to what's already been said. And I would, I would thinking about, um, <laughs> seeing successful companies and the entrepreneurs that talk about, I had this one chance meeting, I was thinking about your timing comment, right? I, I, I met this person at a conference and they introduced me to this person and it made all the difference, right? So um, folks that are entrepreneur are already courageous, right? You're already out there doing things and, and believing in yourself, which is huge but also value the connections that you can make, right? There is uh, exponential value in a network, right? And if you can surround yourself and meet folks and they can be thinking about you, right? They can be excited with you. They you build the champions. I think someone yesterday said, you know, it changed everything when I had this champion and people believed in that champion and they believed in me, right? So um, don't dismiss the value of networking and just meeting people because you might meet someone today and it doesn't mean anything, right? You, you, they were fun to talk to and it was interesting and we had an interesting conversation and then two years later, their business, something has changed and they remembered you and maybe you can help them and that connection gets made. So just because something doesn't happen immediately doesn't mean that there's not value in building a network and having those connections that you can uh, sort of draw on, almost like a bank account, you know, uh, in, for the future. Yeah, absolutely. Building for the future. You don't know when somebody you meet today is going to be the one who helps you with a problem down the line. Yeah. Let's open it up for questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? All right. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, thanks for taking out the time to do this today. It's a wonderful panel. Uh, Beth and Nick, I suppose this question is for you. Uh, to give some context, my name is Deval. I'm the founder of a company called Lotus. For people with disabilities, we make a ring that controls objects at home by pointing. In essence, we build hardware. Mm -hmm. My question is, what is the best way to gauge product market fit before launch? We're about six months away from launch. What are some signals that are good indicators of product market fit, or what are the best ways to gauge that pre-launch? 
Have you tried selling that idea with some pre-sales? Yeah, so the way we're doing it right now is using our prototypes, yep. alphas and betas, to go about talking to sort of who we believe our go-to-market strategy fits with. Uh, but I don't know if that's the best way. Uh, if there are other indicators. Great. When when people give you money, that is the signal. <laughs> uh, we launch. I, I, absolutely. I, so I, when I launched the fluency score, I was I had the idea. I pre-sold the first contract six months before I wrote any code. I actually didn't know what the code. I didn't even know how we were oh. going to approach solving the problem. I just knew the problem needed to be solved, and I found a customer willing to to put money down. And then I started like actually building something, and um, and so I I will like I I I'm very opposed to uh, free trials in the earliest days because they can be uh, such a signal of people wanting to be supportive, but not necessarily a signal that they that they need the thing you're proposing or that it solves that problem. So. Um, the being able to say, hey, I think we can solve this. Do you want to be one of our first customers? We're taking pre-orders. Um, you can always refund that money if like something doesn't go the way it needs to or it doesn't solve the problem. You can be an honest, you know, a business person in this process, but you're you're learning the most through that interaction and in that conversation. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually curious from Nick from a hardware perspective. Yeah. Um, I mean, demand is what you want to find. Uh, and so I think sales, and there, that's a great way to prove that there's demand there. Um, but yeah, I think you know, for us, we we try to you know do pilots. You know, we do more B two B work versus B two C work, um, and so you know we can uh, understand the, cu the customers' needs and, and what thresholds of costs they're willing to support. But uh, yeah, I, I would agree with with Beth. If you can get someone to pay for it. Um, they value your product more than they value their own money. Like that's a great indicator. Thank you very much. Terrific. We've got quite the queue going. Um, let's have the next question. Um, hi, my name is uh, Sam. So I come from a different type of uh, highly regulatory, regul well, yeah, um, industry. Uh, I come from aesthetics. So I think injectables, neuromodulators, you know, medical devices, right? So. Um, every so often, there is some technology that's thrust into the aesthetics world um, that is not DTC. It's B2B to DTC, so it's physician dispensed. Um, and they, they're not trying to solve a problem. They're just trying to say, I've been working on this for 10 years. I, you know, I want to be the next big thing. So separate from um, Deb's question, um, I have a technology in my background that uh, got thrust into the market. It's been purchased, but it is uh, flailing in the market. Uh, like nobody knows how to use it. Nobody knows how to recommend it to patients, so on and so forth. So my question is um, all of the other uh, portions of the Anna Karina situation is checked, but it's in the market, it's dying. When do you know when to pull back and say, this needs to come out and this needs to be reworked? And how do you deal with the egos that will not accept that? Fun question. <laughs> and we're all looking at each other. <laughs> I mean, I feel like you guys have probably experienced that more than 40 times in your life. Uh, there's probably a lot to unpack in, in that, <laughs> that scenario. I think that's where like my like sigh is like, oh, I want to ask you like five more follow-ups. So it's like I have tricky to, tricky to, <laughs> to, to, to manage in this process. Uh, but the ego piece is the one that really caught my attention because I think in this work, especially when we're in, if we're innovating, if we're trying to be, bring something and solve a problem, like there's really not a place for ego in this work. Like we're either solving a problem and helping customers and they want it, or it's or we're not, and it, and we have to br like bring some curiosity and some humility to that work, and say we don't know all the answers. It's when we're inter inter interacting with our customers that we learn from them. We're not right; they're right. How can we learn from them and then adjust to meet those needs? And so, I don't know all the scenario there, but that's the one that caught my attention as maybe like a, a crunch point in what you're you're dealing with. Yeah, and the other thing that I would say about that just piling on to that is, is there a market? What I heard you say is, 
Uh, they don't know what to, you know, the physicians don't know how, how to prescribe it, they don't know what to do with it, they don't know how to use it. And so how much work went into all the things that I talked about earlier about where do we fit in the market and is there a market, is there customer demand for it, is there a signal there? And then you just kind of have to be honest with yourself to best point about, let's, let's evaluate this and see, is this really the right pathway? Is there something else that can be done? Or um, I don't want to say pull the plug, but I mean, it, sometimes those decisions have to be made. You just have to, re, you have to pivot and say, this is not working and it's unlikely to work in, in the near term, right? Thank you. All right, next question. Hi, my name's uh, Alex. I'm uh, the founder of a company called Calabria. We're building the ChatGPT for helping students and teachers in the classroom. Um, and my question is sort of about um, kind of following off of some of the stuff that you were talking about, but the wrinkle where I see sort of a separation in my experience and the, and the things you guys were talking about was how you sort of handle these things when <clears throat> the comparables and the types of sort of products that are out there in the market are still evolving. You know, this, this category of AI tutor or teaching assistant, I think we kind of all agree that it's going to happen maybe, but like, you know, it's not done yet, right? Um, and specifically, how do you think about going from kind of that early stage, which is where I'm at now, to thinking about like moving into that business strategy and that really next level when like for example you can't hire somebody who has that direct experience kind of like what you guys are talking about um yeah um I, I would say you know start by making sure that you're understanding the market well you understand um the what the opportunities are there um for us you know we, we've got a massive engineering team and one of our most important functions at our company is our product department because our product department like points that huge resource at a, per, a certain direction. Mm -hmm. So you might look at making sure you really have a good product lead or that kind of function at, at your uh, on your team. Mm -hmm. um, that could be a really helpful uh, resource to kind of make sure you're pointing it uh, point at the right direction and assembling the right resources to solve it. Thank you. And we've got one final question. Hi, um, I'm here with your second ed tech question. My name is Amrina, um, and I'm building a company called Edbetter, and uh, we're building an instructional coaching platform for K-12 classrooms, so this would be an in-classroom tool with a focus on foundational mathematics and early literacy. Um, um, I believe it was you, Beth, you talked a little bit about the need to differentiate between whether you're a product company or a service company. Um, and in the world that I am trying to build for, um, yes, we want to get the technology and the product right, but um, what, what we know, I've, I've been in, in a civil servant for 20 years, but what I know about my industry is adoption of that product and use of that product is king. Um, and we're asking heavily overburdened teachers and instructional coaches to use our product. Um, and uh, as such, we, uh, in our company, we're putting a lot of uh, focus on product support um, and increasing adoption. So uh, we know that without the handholding, our users will really struggle. Um, so could you speak a little bit about the intersection of product and service um, in a business where that interdependence, inter interdependency can really be make or break? Was, was that for me? I, I, I think Nick was the one that was oh, talking about product right. and service. Okay. <laughs> um, I, think, I don't know if you had any thoughts. I think that actually might have been me, but happy, oh, to, happy yeah. to put it to the yeah. two of you first. I'd be no, I, I'm, thoughts. Yeah. I'm happy to hear what you have to say. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think you just need to be intentional about, you know, what is your business model and, and um, uh, like for us, you know, there's a very big difference between being a service-oriented company versus being a product-oriented company. Um, I think, you know, you just think about like what is a repeatable process that you can you can operate over again and again from to create a value for the company. Um, that's sort of how we evaluated those two different trade-offs for us. So, and I would add to that too, just to go back to what we talked about earlier, which is understand your customer, right? So if you have a product that you can sell to somebody but they don't know how to use it without your services, right? So think about that combination and, and then will they pay for services at, uh, to make it a meaningful product buy, right, and, and product adoption. So I think there is a balance to be struck and, and part of that is understanding what your customer pain points are and the value proposition that you're proposing, whether it's that's a product or a service. 
a common thread here really seems to be intentionality and customer focus. Lots of ways to build a great product business, a great service business, something in the middle. The key is understanding what you're trying to do and sticking to your North Star. Um, one final question. Hi. Great panel, really enjoyed it. A lot of things uh, resonates with what we're doing, building our company. Um, and one thing that really stuck with me was the, the topic of trust in the core team. So we're blessed with having a really strong founding team with experts within their domains. We're serial entrepreneurs, we've done a lot of times. And uh, we're doing quite well, like we've grown quickly, we're making money before the product even hasn't been launched, so super happy about that. However, we've, um, we're a distributed team, so we're in different countries, most of us. Um, and we have hired, or we have a lot of people in the team that, you know, trust have to be earned. And it's quite hard building trust when you're not in the same physical location, you're working with different types of challenges, just a lot of stress. Um, so do you have any ideas on how do you build trust in distributed teams with high velocity, you know, a lot of focus on merit, so social factors not super strong? <laughs> Yeah, you know I, I mean? I, I, I'll jump all over that. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. Uh, so I built Fluent in, I started Fluent in 2018, fully remote from the beginning before it was pandemic cool. And um, I think that uh, the key for us in doing that was just having rituals in, in the way that the team gathered throughout the day or throughout the week. Uh, the, a cadence for that, that was primarily focused on two things, transparency around the work that's being done, especially if you're like fully distributed. Like you don't know what anyone on the team is doing and you won't know until they show up with like having completed something. So like building in like more communication than you think is reasonable around what are people doing and what help they need and where their roadblocks are. A lot of this is just the rituals that come from Agile and Scrum, um, which can be applied to like workflows way outside of just building a software product. Um, but then the other component from Scrum that I think is maybe even more important for building trust and, and culture is the retrospective and having a really consistent cadence. So like even if you don't do stand-ups, even if you don't have like a Scrum board and kind of do a sort of like the formal rituals that come from Agile, if there is a every two weeks the team gets together and talks about what worked, what didn't work, and what you could try around how the team operates, not about the actual product or the, the like technology or whatever, but literally like what's working about how we're talking and working and collaborating and how we're tackling these problems, what could we try next around those things, transformative for how the, 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 the team tackles hard things and, and is capable of kind of managing the stress and the uncertainty that come with any innovation. A great parting piece of advice, trust and rituals. Uh, since we are at time, I want to put a final question to the other two panelists for their parting pieces of advice. Nick and Julia, one piece of advice for companies looking to build for growth. I mean, I'm just thinking of your last point. Uh, trust is really important and um, do whatever you have to do to get there, you know, whether that's, you know, traveling and being in person, you know, once a year or twice a year or something like that. But uh, yeah, I think trust is a big part of it. And Julia? So, you know, ATI is a collaboration company, so I would just reiterate the comment that I made earlier, which do not underestimate the value of a network and those that you surround yourself with. We talked about that as the importance of the management team. All of those things are important because at the end of the day, people run businesses, right? They don't run themselves. Trust, collaboration, and people. On that note, thank you so much to our panelists for the discussion today. Thank you to South by Southwest and ATI, and to all of you for being a great audience. Thank you.